I am unashamed. What about you? I had a really exciting moment. You know, when you're raising teenagers, it can be challenging. And so <laughs> any bit of good news, you know, you see a report card with all A's, you're like, hey, all right, what's going on? Well, yesterday my daughter, she gets a letter in the mail, and she's like, I see her. She kind of stopped in her tracks as she's reading it because I got the mail, gave it to her. She's like, I won. I said, what'd you win? Uh, you know, I was thinking, you know, this publishing, clearing, how, whatever. Yeah, I <laughs> bet you won. She's like, no, at my school, which she, you know, there's 2,500 students at her school. She said, you could submit an essay uh, about why history is important. And it's a national competition. And they pick two kids from each state. And she said, I'm, I'm, I'm one from Louisiana. I was like, are you serious? Let me look at that. You know, it wasn't, wasn't like I didn't believe her. And when but I read it, it was like all expense paid. I knew it was legit when it said all expense paid. Well, you know, we will pay you to come to Washington, D.C. with the other 99 Nine, students. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I said, well, what did you write the essay? Where is this essay? <laughs> and she, she said, well, I basically wrote it on why – that we need our uh, historical monuments despite the people who we made the monuments of or the situations, despite them not being perfect. It's part of our history. It's what what built America. You know, I was like, well, I got to read this now, which I never did get a copy of it. She was like, well, I sent it off. I was like, well, where's your notes? You know, she said, I'll get it for you. But anyway, I thought that was exciting. I, I was thinking, now that... That is that is awesome. She said, well, I kind of came from a spiritual angle in that, you know, we all make mistakes. But when you think about how great America is, you celebrate the process by which it came to be. You see why. Yeah. And so I was like, good job here. That's I mean, amazing. I, I never didn't yeah. know that she had that in her. I've never well, had a conversation. I, I mean, she's very musical. You know, she, she reminds yeah, me that's, of, of Ree where she can play, she plays the piano, you know, and it's, uh, uh, I love it. You know, when we took her cell phone away a while back when she was going through a, you know, who am I going to be? She really flourished with, I guess, writing as well as, you know, playing the piano and different things. It's amazing when you, give kids the opportunity and you give them more time that they were just wasting on a cell phone that it, what they'll do. And so I'm, which I'm by really the way, excited. that's a good little parenting advice. I've raised teenagers. Dad's raised kids. Jace is almost through raising his is with this interference now of phones and internet and tablets and all that stuff. You, you really should. I mean, typically we do it now as a punishment because that's the one thing they appreciate the most, but we really should just have some time where you just say, you know, we're not going to do phones for X amount. Oh, well, look, I mean, all her friends and every kid, if they're below 18, we have an 18 year old uh, rule at my house. When you walk into my house, it is a no cell phone area. You're getting there, Chase. You turn it in. You're getting there. And look, now I don't even say a word. <laughs> He's getting there, Al. And, <laughs> Phil, I never said <laughs> that you didn't have You've a point. You've been telling him all along. I, but cell phones can be useful, you know, but they can also be a detriment, especially to an immature mind. You can't just hand it to them and say, good luck. You're right. I mean, look, you know, we have this new... Uh, I know we can talk about something else, but I have to tell you this story. I'm, we had these new roundabouts at our at our town, and that uh, I love. Well, I do too. But our society, let's face it, <laughs> where we live, I'm I'm going to try to be nice. I love where I live, okay, and I love the people. But let's face it, that roundabout. There's three of them right in a row. They just taught me something about our culture that we currently <laughs> live. They're not the brightest bulbs around. Well, they're like scared of them, which is so crazy because, look, the Europeans have missed it on a lot of stuff, but they got it on the roundabouts because have you noticed how there's no traffic now? Well, like it's, it used to. it's so so much quicker. But look, I'm coming up the other day, and you got to remember it's construction. Once it all gets finished, I think it will be easier for everybody. But I come up there, and there's two lanes 
that you can go in the roundabout where there's a person stopped. You know, you're supposed to yield if someone's coming. Well, there's no one coming because I'm looking way up as driving. I'm looking at the situation. That's what I do, too. I have a person stopped in my lane, so I'm going to go to the other lane. Whoop, there's somebody coming, so I have to slow down. Well, I'm a, I'm a horn blower because <laughs> they gave the horn to you for a reason. You know, a lot of people now, they're scared of road rage or whatever, so they don't blow the horn. Right. I blow the horn. Because I'm like, we have a person who stopped at a roundabout where it's a yield and there's no one coming. So I just laid on the horn. (laughs) Well, the person passed. They're not moving yet. So then I thought, well, maybe the car broke down. So I finally squeeze around them. And look, it's a woman. She's looking at me. She's on her cell phone. And she's looking at me like, why are you blowing the horn? (laughs) And I'm like, live. (laughs) As I went by, all I said was live. <laughs> Her life has stopped at a roundabout checking this message and then is offended because I could tell by the look. Oh, She's yeah. like, "How? I, I'm on the phone here. <laughs> and oh. you're like, drive, woman. I mean, live. <laughs> Just sit there. I'll be through in a minute. <laughs> you're not, you're no longer living. When you pull up and just, you say, I'm in a dangerous intersection. I have a phone call. I'm stopping right here. The power of the cell phone. And then when the horn is, when the alert goes off, her response should have been, oh, what the heck am I doing? I could cause a wreck. I'm on the cell phone. But no, she's looking at me like, how dare you? Uh, Look, I'm on the phone. So I don't know. I just... I don't know where that came from. I don't know. So what have y'all been up to? You had to to get it out. But I am happy about it. I'm very proud. That that was awesome. So we love talking cell phones with Dad uh, because, you know, all of you know how much he loves them. And uh, every time Jason and I have a conversation about it, it's like, you know, Dad glazes over. Uh, But we got to talk about cell phones again because we got a really good company, uh, Patriot Mobile. It's a cell phone company. Of course, you heard, uh, you've probably seen commercials on some of the other big, you know, cell phone companies, but you don't really know what they do. Um, I'll tell you what they do. Most of them is they are behind a lot of left wing causes. Well, and they, what do you know? Yeah, shocker, right? And high tech. Yeah. yeah. Well, the good news about Patriot Mobile is they're not that. Um, basically, they donate, you know, money they make uh, to some of the same things Here's we believe in. Here's my comment to Silicon Valley. You didn't get me, dude. <laughs> but if you were going to get involved, you would go with the Patriot. That's right. You go with the Patriot, right? If you were going to get a cell phone, you would sign up for Patriot Mobile. You are Mobile. correct. All right, good. Well, that's, see, that's about good. the heart, Phil. It's all that matters. That's exactly Richard. right. So if you start out with these guys, $25, unlimited talk, text, nationwide service. Uh, you can switch easily. You keep your own number, or you can get you a new phone if you want to. Uh, they have a great selection of phones. So if you go to patriotmobile.com slash Phil, which always makes me chuckle, patriotmobile.com slash Phil, you get free activation, plus you're going to get a special gift offer when you put in Phil's name uh, when you check out. So it's Patri- go to patriotmobile.com slash Phil, or if you want to call them, it's 972-PATRIOT, 972-PATRIOT. Either way, they can get you switched over. Feels like Peter, he's following the cell phones at a distance. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dad, you need to tell us about your. Yeah. You know, we've had a. <laughs> for the last few months, it's all been about Dad's ailments. Now you got something new to yeah, show. Yeah, you know, you hit about 74. I'm nearly there. Uh-oh. Uh, so It's just a number, Phil. So um, I get my waiters out during duck season, they're in a closet. In a barn. Remember, barn being the key word. It's kind of like, it's a barn. I have my waiters. They've been in there since last year. We've seen this before. When you get your waiters, and we've got it down out a little bit of a science, you shake your waiters just in case a black widow spider is not in your waiters before you put your feet in your waders. Or wharf rat. Or wharf rat uh, and other... Congo. Other brown recluse, brown who recluse, knows, yeah. copperheads. Scorpions. So I, I slid into my waders, and sometime between then and a couple hours later, I felt a slight, just a slight sting 
right right here. Oh, I hadn't so, heard this story. Yeah, had a slight sting, and I thought, ooh, ee. I said a fire ain't. I figured a fire ain't got me, so I'm I'm trying to wad up the waiters to kill you know, the fire to kill him because I I'd had to come out of my waiters mm-hmm. looking at my bristly. So what transpired from that is is now you, this is the result of the sting on my leg. You see that? But have you identified what stung you? No. I just told <laughs> one, of our, duck hunting, or one, one of our duck hunting buddies, I'm sitting there in my chair, and this thing, a a uh, a knot uh, came up on my leg. Uh-oh. A, as they would say in the business, probably something like sebaceous uh, cyst, <laughs> whatever. But there's a knot there that came up. It doesn't have a head on it. But it's just a a a, 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 a you Is can it, roll you can roll it around. It's up under the skin. It's like a hunk, uh, a fatty hunk of meat right up under the skin. There is there a is there a sting or fang mark under that? It, it was just sort of purplish right on top, but it never came out to be a head. This so I funny. first just I said, okay, I've had enough of that. Give me a good needle, and I put a little alcohol on it. Have you had any fever? No, no, no. And I, I, I stuck the needle down in the thing. I said, well, I'll, let me see if I can relieve that that pain, and, and maybe it's infected down in there. So I insert a needle into it. All I see is blood. That was phase one. Phase two was, I said, well, most people I, called, go to a doctor. I called the boy <laughs> that married That's never going to be his fault. Yeah, I know. And I'm getting to the doctor. <laughs> so I call up and I, and I stone my the boy that married your your daughter. Yeah, I know him. So well. he's my son-in-law. So <laughs> who has no my... medical skills whatsoever? No. Hey, I, that's right. However, <laughs> he told me the guy that we've been duck hunting with. Oh, the nurse practitioner is a nurse practitioner. Yeah, to me, is. a nurse practitioner is right under a brain surgeon. I mean, he's there. <laughs> So I call Stone up. I said, call the nurse practitioner. I called him nurse man. I said, call the nurse man up and ask him, did he get any training during his nurse practitioner format? Did he get any training with sebaceous cyst, possibly a black widow bite? It's a, it's a ball. So he calls him up and he says, Phil wants to know, are, are you trained to do minor surgery? That's what I wanted to know. Well, the nurse practitioner said, tell him that I do have the training to do that. He said, get really? a cell phone, get somebody's cell phone, get the eunuch, the eunuch with the cell phone. So I said, take a picture of it and send it to me and let me look at it before I, before I go further. Now, see, so, if you so, hadn't had a cell phone, I told you. I'm out of luck. So I said, Dan, it's you got, a, you got saving that black, your life. I said, Dan, you got, the, you got that black box on you? I'm talking to the eunuch who's Miss Kay's butler who hangs around the house working. So he takes a picture of this, sends it to the nurse practitioner, and he said, I'll be down there. I can take care of it. I'll be down there at 8 o'clock on Thursday morning. I said, fine. So he rolls in there. And he said, put your leg up on the dining room table. And I said, I'll lay my leg up there like oh, that. that makes me feel good. Did he, he said, like okay, shave it out or did you shave so it? I said, before you start, uh, let me let me uh, go over one little point that I asked Stone about. You said you had been trained for, for a little minor surgery. He said, that's correct. I said, did you do your training on a mannequin, some kind of... <laughs> plastic body how do you how do you work on that he said no i got my training from the er room with the drunks and the meth heads he said that's who i practice on i said that's a lot of practice he said oh listen i i've, I've cut them every way you can cut them so i said good training but where's so the put- diagnosis i don't even know what this is yet well, it's just a, a knob, a, no, a, 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 a fatty sebaceous he called it cyst up under the skin is it did it co- come from something biting you well it came from somewhere <laughs> and it won't leave <laughs> this is the most disturbing thing i've ever heard but it came from somewhere. The i don't table. know the cause of it but i'm like i've got it there it's <laughs> bothering me and i and it's getting bigger i said so let's. did he say did something bite you I told him i felt a <laughs> sting and he said huh he said well now it's a cyst <laughs> huh and look the first thing he does which is pretty cool. Did you agree uh, not this, to sue you him? See where this is? He took a magic marker 
And he looked Hold at on. it. Keep and in look, the, keep and in look. he goes, he takes a magic marker, and he draws a circle about that big up here. And yeah. I said, so you're starting out with a magic marker doing a circle. I said, what's the, I, I know I'm, I'm watching my surgery take place. I said, why the circle there? And he said, that's where I'm going to cut. I'm like, and I looked down, I said, whew, pretty good size circle. So he takes a little knife. It's not that long. And I'm looking at it. He said, should I deaden it? I said, I just, how long is it going to take? He said, not long. I said, I don't need any to deaden it. He said, let me give you a little bit. I said, whatever you think. So he he took a needle and stuck it in about four or five different places around that thing, took a little knife. The knife was about this long, a little bitty thing, but it looked sharp. And look, he just took that thing, and he just made a circle where he had uh, put the line, and he just picked it up and said, hmm. He said, pretty good size. So he puts that on a napkin folds the skin back up like that so it, it was just he bored out a hole well, all the he, way down he, to the it would look like in a, in a, a mini grand canyon just a a <laughs> volcano with a, a hole mini grand canyon <laughs> yeah well a mini <laughs> volcano so i now i'm looking and there's a hole in my leg he squeezes the skin up like this i'm going through the procedure here and look he began to take a needle with thread, and he put about five stitches on that, and and he said, don't worry about putting anything on it. He said, I'll be back in about a week. I'll take the stitches out, rock and roll. So I said, the only difference between right now and 150 years ago, I said, 150 years ago, the doctor would have come riding up on a horse. He'd have been on a horse. He had got his bag. He had walked in there, and he said, okay, what do we have here? And that's the way they did it. I said, the only difference is you drove up in a truck instead of riding up on a horse. I horse said, I said, we're old school. You know what I'm saying? I said, what's this going to cost me? He said, nothing. I said, there you go. Well, he wants to go duck hunting again. Well, <laughs> he's a friend. <laughs> well, that's priceless. So I, tra- I trusted him. He's a friend. He took yeah. it out. And let me tell you something. I have felt no, not a twinge of anything since. It doesn't hurt. But we don't, the, still the don't know what is gone. caused it. Whatever caused it, who knows? Mm-hmm. He, he just, just said, how long ago was that when you felt the sting? That was during duck season? Three or four months ago. Oh, well, that's. I mean, it, it took That would have helped the story out. Well, it, like, how did the thing get that big so quick? Three to four months, it got bigger and bigger and bigger. And I finally said, you know what? You know, how long am I going to wait here? Somebody said, well, why didn't you go to, a, you know, up here? The, the guy, he's been trained. So I but just, Phil, I've seen you, and I saw this. This this happen. was quicker, for sure, cheaper. I said, "Hey, if you want me?" So to, what you're you, saying I, is I, that I, if send you, me the bill on it. And if he you, said, can, oh, no, if you can avoid it. going to medical outposts, as you call them, then you just soon do that. You just know sometimes, what I've noticed? Sometimes though, your living room <laughs> is the outpost. <laughs> well, I've noticed. I've had an epiphany here about you because I saw you do something one time. I've seen you perform surgeries on dogs. I've done minor surgery myself. Well, on well, I know, but I noticed something. When it was on you, you you called in a professional. Because, look, I saw a, a kid get a devil horse, a, a treble hook, caught in his hand. And deep. You remember this? Oh, yeah. And he went up there and was like, what am I going to do? You know, it's, it's, I mean, it was just buried. And we anybody's fish, we've all had this happen. And Phil was like, absolutely no problem i've done this a hundred times like oh yeah and i could tell it was relief you know so he tried to push it through and he was gonna cut the end of the heart you know the bar ball but he tried that that didn't work so he just couldn't the guy's hollering you know he feels like oh you'd be all right and so phil (laughs) said well if that don't work he said then what you do is he took that hook he said you form a mountain and he just pulled the hook up and i'm telling you like his hand he's he's coming up his hand (laughs) It's just like coming up. Yeah. And he said, you form the mountain. And then Phil grabbed his knife real quick and said, then you cut the top of the mountain off. <laughs> so and when it big... went back down, Presto. that was just a <laughs> hole. And blood was just pouring out. By the way, that got infected on that guy. And, and he went to a doctor about it. And, and the doctor said, who did that? He said, well, my buddy said he could handle it. <laughs> and the doctor said, don't let him get a hold of you again. <laughs> <laughs> but why didn't you do it to yourself is what's 
you know, no. concerning to me. No, he wanted to get well, this right. person right under the brain surgeon to, to yeah. handle it on the kitchen table. But I'm just saying, I'm telling, I'm telling the audience a story. It worked out for me. It's great. <laughs> uh, I had a little cataract surgery here, so I'm, I'm falling apart. In other words, I got the, I got the cyst on my leg. I got my eye. I'm going blind. The 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 the, uh, the eyes healed up great. Kind of right. That's been I about two weeks ago. Water. You never did reattach it's, your bicep. By the way, I have 2015. 2015. So there's no time. Well, what you're you getting into size. You're getting into size. The eye man said, "Man, you." That you Rob, still you, got your unicep arm without the you no longer. Yeah, yeah. yeah, the old muscle bound up on me. Tore this loose, but it got purple. <laughs> and stayed that way about a week but then it just went away and i said y'all can y'all tie this back together he said yeah is it bothering you i said nah it's all right i said it didn't, didn't hurt he said i'll let it go work it out in the resurrection <laughs> sure <laughs> so right, i'm look. just saying uh, for the people who live in the subdivisions and the major cities in america our audience just remember i mean simplicity <laughs> nerve press technique they, you, you know what i'm saying all cheaper right. A lot quicker. You don't have to go up there. And people want, want you autograph and sitting in the clinic. And... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, most people, it's not, that's not a real big deal. All right, I'm them. preaching Sunday, and I'm going to do something I've never done before. Because, you know, it's I, I've been speaking every other week here lately. But I go around to crowds, and they're awesome. But you come back home, and it reminds you of that verse that a prophet has no honor in his hometown when Jesus said that. Yep. Because people know you. Because I'm telling you, it is, you know, our home city at our church. It's just, it's a tough crowd. Yeah. Would you agree? Because you spoke there last week. I did. It's like the jokes are not as funny. Uh, Any stories you tell, they've already heard it. I've been there 30, 40 years. Yeah. It's hard to speak to the same audience. Yeah. It's hard. So I was going to give you all what I'm thinking. And then y'all tell me. Yeah, try that on us. And then we'll see. Right. Well, I don't I don't really have it yet, but we're going through the book of John pretty much. I mean, y- yeah. you went off into marriage last week. Right. I kept waiting for the, you know, we're all married to Jesus and then tied in with John somehow. You know, because a lot of times we're trapped into mm-hmm. our series, but right. you just said, no, nope, taking a week off going to go. marriage. We That's didn't right. go to the book Just like the podcast, you never know where we're going. That's right. So in John 1, when John the Baptist ran across Jesus as, okay, he's the one. And we, we, we've we talked about this before. But in verse 32, it says, Then John gave this testimony, I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. Now, he's talking about Jesus' baptism. Right. And it says, I would not have known him except that the one who sent me to baptize with water told me the man on whom you see the Holy Spirit come down and remain is he who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And we talked about that before. He poured it out, Acts 2. Okay. I have seen and I testify, which I like this declaration. Here's another bumper sticker from John the Baptist. I have seen and I testify that this is the Son of God. Uh, By the way, when I was studying, you know, I was talking about John the Baptist and his bumper sticker quotes. I found another one. In John 3 and verse 35, it says, he said, the Father loves the Son and has placed everything in his hands. You just think about that statement. You know, Jesus, who we follow and serve as Lord, he has everything in his hands. It's a pretty awesome thought. Mm -hmm. So anyway, here's what I'm going to do with this. Because we're in John, that's where the thought came from. I, I said a few weeks ago that I went to a worship conference and I heard this guy preach a sermon called From the Water to the Wilderness. And I gave a little bit of yeah, it in a podcast yeah. we talked about. And so that comes from John 3, I mean, uh, Matthew 3 and 4. You have the baptism of Jesus that John just described, but, but Matthew 3 goes into detail. And when you combine it with Mark's account, <clears throat> Mark has a key phrase. Right when John baptized Jesus, it says the Holy Spirit comes on him. God says three things, which I'll have this part of my lesson. This is my son, whom I love, and with him I'm well pleased. Because I believe the same thing is uttered since we die. We're crucified with Christ. God gives us the Spirit. I think that declaration is made. And those are the 
the beliefs that we have that's going to carry us through in our faith. You, when you get into tough time, you think, well, God loves me. I'm a son of God. I'm a daughter of God, and I please him. That's right. And I have the Holy Spirit of God in me. These are all things I've said when I've been nervous or I'm in a situation, even in high school, you know, when I was getting peer pressure or whatever, right. I was thinking, I got the Holy Spirit of God. I'm not taking them lip off this guy. You know, I'm a son of God. I, these are those declarations. So I'll go through that. But in Mark's version, it says, at once, the Holy Spirit immediately, the Holy Spirit led him to the wilderness. Because we have these chapter divisions in our Bible, we tend to think, oh, that's at a later date. As soon as he was baptized, the Holy Spirit carried him to the temptation in the wilderness. Right. Well, when you read through that temptation in Matthew four, here comes the evil one. What I've here's where I'm at in my study, and y'all y'all maybe help me. The evil one begins to tempt him and he says in verse three if you're the son of god tell these stones to become bread well i went back in my mind to genesis 3 when the evil one was in a garden and he tempted adam and eve and you remember the first thing he told eve he said did god really say and this is kind of the same He's going down the same road. Well, if you're the son of God, you know, tell these stones to become bread. And he was telling Eve, uh, did God really say that if you eat? So the first thing he wants you to question. Well, Jesus answers, it is written, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up, he quoted Deuteronomy 8. Well, when I went over there and looked at Deuteronomy 8, it was basically talking about the Exodus where Moses, you have the Red Sea moment. Because remember, this is from the water to the wilderness. Well, the Red Sea, something spectacular happened. They have this awesome moment like Jesus had receiving God's Holy Spirit. And then what happened? They went to the wilderness. I mean, same concept, you know. And so Deuteronomy 8, of which he quotes here, basically talks about why God sent them to the wilderness, that they would trust him, that they would depend on him, that they would realize that true wealth and success comes from him. You can read it. It's a, it's a, I don't know how I missed it. So going back to the Genesis parallel, you have the next temptation, which is he says, uh, The devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you're the son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it is written, here's the evil one quoting scriptures, you know. Well, when I went back to Genesis 3, I see another parallel. You know, first he he asked Eve, did God really say? Well, then in verse 4, he says of Genesis 3, he says, you won't die. Remember, he Mm -hmm. he said, you won't die. But he's basically saying the same thing. To the Son of God, throw yourself down. You know, you won't die if you're the Son of God, because you. It, it's the same concept. Of course, Jesus said, "Don't put the Lord, you know, your God to the test." And then the last temptation, He says uh, again. Now, this one I have more trouble with, but it says again, the devil took him to a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world, and all this I'll give you if you bow down. Well, you would think. Well, why would that be a temptation of Jesus? Because he already has everything. That's tend to what we think. But the more I got to thinking about it is what he was offering him is you didn't have to go through the pain. You know, just look at what Jesus had to go through, the humility of being a human, being trapped as a man, going through the pain, putting up with other humans, going through the process, he's dying. and You, you, you could just, of course, it's a temporary solution, which is what the evil one does. But that was the temptation. Well, that compares to Genesis 3 where he says, verse 5, For God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, uh, knowing good good and evil. When, By the way, Jace, uh, uh, all this Satan talking to Jesus, I will give you. In other words, you know, throw yourself down uh, if, if you will bow down and worship me. Right. And then Jesus said, 
worship the Lord your God only and serve him only. He said, no, I'm not bound down to you over for anything. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, but the, and my point is the temptation was the same. He was telling Eve, you can be your own God. Yep. And, I, and he was basically appealing to Jesus in the same way. Same saying, way. You know, let's do this together. Do and what I say. You don't have to go through the process, which is my point about the water in the, in the wilderness, is that fast forward to us. What does this mean to us? Well, once you declare Jesus as Lord, and you can read this from First Peter to Ephesians, where you get to put on the armor of God, or First Peter at the end where he says, don't be surprised when if you're insulted in the name of Christ. When you declare Jesus as Lord and you receive God's spirit and you're on the top of the mountain and he says, yeah, you're my son or daughter, I love you, I'm pleased with you, well, now you're headed to the wilderness. It's coming. The And the same reason that's described in Deuteronomy 8, which the point is and the point I'm going to make, and I'm finishing up, then I'll get your this, – this is the overall philosophical view of what I'm giving, is what he was conveying in Deuteronomy 8 is that it doesn't really matter where you're at. You know, I'm using this wilderness just like the uh, the Israelites and just like Jesus in the temptation. It's who you're with. That That's what's – when you go – whatever your wilderness experience is, he was face-to-face with the evil one. With us, like with me, I was in high school when I came to the Lord. Well, my wilderness is – Day one after baptism, when I went back to that public school. Yep. Oh, it was the wilderness then because now I have to start making changes in how I'm operating and what I'm conveying. And, and when I, I did and that. all you needed to follow the crowd, all you needed was to bow down and worship Satan. And you'd have been one of them. There's a mighty throng. Uh all this I will give you, showed them all the kingdoms. If you'll bow down and worship me, Satan said. Well, once you you went back to the school where they bowing down to and guess the what? father. It or, was uh, two years of wilderness. Yep. Because I wasn't strong enough, or I didn't take Jesus' charge here. I wasn't using Scripture, because he quoted three Scriptures, as a weapon. I was just trying to get out of there without screwing up. Which, you know, I I admit, but it was a two year wilderness process. And basically, what, what, where I'm getting that is, is in Hebrews three and four, which I don't know how to use this, but two chapters that I've never really hung out in much, but it's an illustration of Moses leading the Israelites through the wilderness to what Jesus offers. And, about the second or third verse, now you can read the whole thing on your own time, and I know y'all are familiar with it, but in in Hebrews 4, it says, uh, verse 1, Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, because he's comparing it when the Israelites were going to go to the you know promised land, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have had the gospel preached to us just as they did, but the message they heard was of no value to them because those who heard it did not combine it with faith. And here's my point. When we hear the gospel, what Jesus did, and we respond, we have our water moment. We're baptized. We have the Holy Spirit of God. We're on the top of the mountain. Well, what is faith? Faith is being sure of what we hope for. Well, the wilderness is the are you sure? Which is what happened with Jesus. You know, this is my son. He's the son of God. We're going to save the world. And the spirit took him out there to the evil one. And basically, if you wanted to sum up what happened is, are you sure? And that that's what happens to all of us. And so I think if people know that, then they're more prepared. Because yeah. look, my first two years of my Christian life was miserable. You know, I was attacked. I was persecuted. I had no friends. You know, it, it was like the exact opposite of what I thought was going to happen. I'm like, oh, you know, I come to Jesus. All my problems are going to be solved. Well, it really, I was pretty comfortable up until that point. And I felt good for a couple your, of days. Your problems were just beginning. <laughs> just beginning because I didn't realize the evil one met me there. 
in the wilderness. And and it's different for everybody, but the good and evil, what happened in the garden replicated itself with Jesus, but then it continues to replicate it ourselves. That's why I brought up Ephesians. He talks about you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. Uh, we're all coming together. There's one Lord and one faith and one baptism. And, you know, don't live like you used to. Live a life of love. And he talked about marriage, you know, and you're married to Jesus. And then he gets to the end and says, put on the full armor of God. Take your stand against the devil, <laughs> the devil schemes. He's coming. Yeah. And that that's where I think the are you sure moment is what a lot of people are not prepared for. So that's the gist of it. That's very sound teaching. What do you Jason? Well, yeah, and what's interesting is Jesus was 30 when this happened. Yeah. So it it is interesting that and we don't read much about and what he happened. had not performed any miraculous act <laughs> up to this well, point. Well, I thought about that. It wasn't based on his performance. He hadn't done anything. That's right. That's right. But the one thing that changed was the moment, the recognition moment mm-hmm. that he and John had, obviously. Well, and the spirit. And this Holy Spirit. So <clears throat> to use your own analogy, if you come forward to us, you know, until we sort of, for lack of a better way to put it, until we get on the clock, till we get in the game, until the Holy Spirit shows up, you know, I don't know the evil one, you know, he's he's obviously working, but we're not as much on his radar until we make a decision. That is true. To take the stand. See what I'm saying? There's I mean, no doubt. See, I think in you look at John the Baptist. I think it's interesting. I got well, on look. a zigzag of a course when I first repented. Yep. Zigzag, I mean zags, not good. <laughs> Zig, pretty good. Zag, no. Because right. you I went was, from the water to the wilderness. That's right. Water to the wilderness. That was your no look at John. Look, look at the pole of where I had been stayed strong. with me for the first year, the strongest yeah. couple of years. And it was like five years later, after walking, I looked around one day. I said, Good night. I haven't been drunk in years. Yeah. Three, four years now. Right. Hmm. First year, first I'm going out, you know, I'm still right. getting drunk. I, I, it took me a while to uh, set my course. That's right. So well, let me tell you this: uh, John the Baptist. Now he came baptizing with water, but he was he was a voice calling out in the wilderness, right? And so pretty good point. Well, but look, and then so what happened? Well, John the Baptist continued. We've already documented this. He continued just pounding on the spiritual principles out in the wilderness. Well, you know, the evil one came to him, and at first I'm sure he tempted him. But, you know, John, the Baptist had the Holy Spirit from birth. And so what did he eventually do? Well, Satan has two tactics. He tempts you like he did Jesus and like he does us. If that doesn't work, he'll just kill you. That, that's what it said. He was a murderer from the beginning, yep, yep. which led to John the Baptist having his head cut off. Yep. Well, Satan did the same thing with Jesus. He tempted him here. That didn't work. So what did he do? Phase two. Well, we get. I'm positive he was in the workings of the leaders, and that's why well, the verse that says the leaders, rulers didn't understand it because if they had, they wouldn't have killed Jesus. Was remember, that remember Corinthians that the remember seven? at the um, the Last Supper, whenever Judas is there, and it said Satan entered him in that moment. I mean, that was the he deal. Said, Who's going to betray you? He said, the one I hand this bread to. And when he handed the bread to Judas, it said at that moment, that moment. Satan entered him. Which is to your point, He <clears throat> Satan thought, oh, well, I'll just wipe him out, just like John the Baptist or anybody else. What he didn't know was that Jesus had already decided he was going to give his life. And so he played into the plan, never knowing. That's right. Which just shows you that people rightfully should fear uh, the power of the evil one, because certainly he's powerful. And there's many, many verses to tell us, look out, watch out. He's powerful. But remember, he's not more powerful than God. He's not no, immortal. Right. No. He's yeah, crea- and I don't he's- know how all that works. That's why I said that temptation, that third temptation, because the evil one, he's not immortal. But evidently in that world, you can live longer than our measly 70 years. And well, you can... He's not human, so yeah. Well, right. And you can... Uh, be you know multiple places you know john made an interesting point they're not bound by the laws of gravity that's right the same john that jesus had been quoting from we're looking at today when he wrote first first john second third john first john over toward the back of your bible uh you dear children are from (laughs) god and have overcome them the world because the one who is in you is greater 
than the one who is in the world. They're from the world, therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world. The world listens to them. We're from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Uh, but whoever is not from God does not listen to us. That's why you can find out the spirit of truth or not. But it's a pretty good point in that once you receive God's spirit, going back to the water moment, you say, one greater than Satan is in you. That's right. Well, that's your. That's the only way you could survive. Uh, uh, yeah, I think if how? we prepare, I mean, it, it makes sense if you go back and think of all the things Jesus said when he said, "Guys said, hey, I'll follow you wherever you go," and he's like, "Foxes have holes and birds have nests, but I don't even have a place to lay my head." It's basically that concept. Are you ready for the wilderness? Because I'm living in it. Yep. You know. Yep. Or he said, "Hey, you know." You want to follow me? You better bring your cross. Yep. It's the same concept. Look, let me throw this little morsel in and see what you think. In Matthew 17, you have a situation happen where Jesus, Moses, and Elijah come together with the disciples, and they, you know, they call it the transfiguration, just because we don't have a word in our society <laughs> to describe. What happened? What happened? There, you know, it says he was transfigured before him. But now, getting back to my water to the wilderness, you had Moses who led the Israelites in victory by God's hand from the Red Sea to the wilderness. You had Elijah, which when I looked up his situation, he was involved in this, it was about 42 months of famine there, and I read the story. But you had Moses 40 years in the in the wilderness. You had Elijah in this 40 months of the famine that he was a part of, and you can, you can check me out on that. Then you have Jesus who had the 40 days with the evil one himself, and they're having a powwow up here of some capacity with God. But I want you to notice what happened from the terminology. You know, Peter comes up and says to Jesus in verse 4, Lord, it's good for us to be here. You know, I'll put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And while he's still speaking, a bright cloud enveloped them. And look, here we go again. And a voice from the cloud said the same thing at what happened at Jesus' baptism. This is my son, whom I love, with I'm well pleased. And you got these other two characters who had similar experiences before Jesus was here. Elijah with the famine, 40 months. Moses with the 40 years. And then he added one thing, listen to him. And I think that's what we realized. The reason Jesus was quoting scriptures, because he was listening to his father, that he was going with the plan in the wilderness. Well, that's the same thing we do. You know, we, we get in the wilderness, whatever the situation is, and you have a, you have a choice. Am I going to listen to what God says? And now prove it in the in the face of evil, or am I just going crater? I mean, I I just think it's it's weird that those it happened to be those two guys. Well, look, I got another interesting tidbit about that. <clears throat> so, another thing that draws those three together: Moses, he didn't go into the promised land, and so he went up on a mountain, Mount Horeb, and it said he died there, and God buried him whatever that means. Yep. And no one ever found and his no body. And no one ever found his body. And then and then Jude, there was a kind of behind the scenes moment where Jude talks about a fight with the evil one over the body of Moses. Yeah. So that's interesting. And then Elijah is just walking along and a big wind picks him up and it says those flaming chariot. And that's how he left the planet. And then, of course, Jesus was resurrected. So that was another thing the three had in common is they had very unusual ways. They, it wasn't a typical like Their all the rest. Their bodies were in question. There's That's no right. body. It's and like that, these murder case, you know, deals like where's the body? That's my point about the resurrection. And for him where's to, the body? For them to show up bodily on top of a hill, standing Jesus talking it over, you're like, yo. Whoa, and you whoa. wonder about because the disciples that were there that saw it, I mean, how would they know? These people lived thousands of years before they did. Yeah. And yet somehow they knew. I may add who that they were. Point. It's not like they had name tags. You well, know? I've said that before. Somebody said I was in some debate or something. There's like, no, no. I mean, just give me one reason why you follow Jesus. 
you know, but they were saying it sarcastically because we were in the heat of our argument. And I said, because they couldn't find his body. And they're like, what, what, what does that mean? I was like, no, I mean, there was a crime. A Someone was killed, and you could search the entire planet. All atoms, molecules, the ground, you're not going to find the body. <laughs> there is no body. <laughs> That's why I'm following it. That's right. <laughs> And every other person that people follow is went in the ground somewhere. As Cy says, it ain't there, boys. It ain't there. I said, Cy, what he told me? He's like, the body, it ain't there. I was like, oh, okay, I got your point. Well, let me say this because I know we're out of time. You know, Peter was standing there watching this, and here's you would think that he got it, but he went on to deny Jesus. Yep. You know, and Jesus reinstates him, but... I can't help but think this water to the wilderness that Peter didn't get it at some point because when he wrote his letter, you know, in first Peter, you just think about what he started off in verse six. He says of chapter one, you know, you rejoice in this. You greatly rejoice though. Now for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials there there. He understood the wilderness concept now, yep. Yep. uh, these have come so that your faith, which is, are you sure, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor through uh, when Jesus Christ is revealed. He finally got it. And the reason I know that is is because he writes that letter and he gets all the way to the end, to chapter 5 and verse 8, and he says... Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour, which this is just a few short verses right past when he talked about baptism and it's the pledge of good conscience towards God. And I was like, he got that principle. And that's what made me really want to do this because I thought it's more than just a happening with Jesus. There's a principle there. This is why we're here. God calls us through Jesus. We surrender. He gives us the Holy Spirit. We're on top of the mountain. It's awesome. I've been saved. Well, guess what? The Spirit's fixed to take you to the wilderness. <laughs> but, but, but remember this. Uh, Matthew 16, 21. Matthew 20, 17. Mark 8, 31. Mark 10, 32. Luke 18, 31. Matthew, Mark, Luke. John 12, 3. You say, what did Jesus tell them? You say, he told him he was going to die. The Pharisees going to take him up to Jerusalem, be buried, and raised from the dead. He told them all what was fixing to happen. Yep. As he went through the wilderness, he said, here's what's fixing to happen. Well, when you get to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, well, what happened? What he said would happen. <laughs> That's right. It, just, yeah. just like he said it. Yeah. But now Peter, he's running for the high hills. He's like, everybody deserted him. You say, it wasn't like they, they weren't told this. Right. I just gave you the ones. So what did he tell them? I'm going to die, be buried, in three days be raised from the dead. He told them that over and over and over. The time came for it to happen. They hit the road. Jesus did what he said. And no one knew, including these guys, so, so two, so that two, th this yeah. is gonna, he's going to save the world. They just didn't get two, it. Two things happened, which is to ironclad your point. He saw a resurrected Lord. Yep. He witnessed the gospel, and the Holy Spirit came for a visit when we get to Acts chapter 1. So and, back, and, he had and, that, and that's what changed him. But and then all of a sudden, he turned but into he a also, preacher. That's right. He also had that conversation with Jesus where he realized that he was going to risk his life. You know, at the right. end of John in 21, yep. he yep. said, you know, one day you're going to be led where you don't want to go. Because that's our problem. Peter didn't follow Jesus, or he denied him, because he didn't want the consequences think of, of the wilderness. Think, he didn't want to face yeah. the music. That, think look, of you know the what? mighty throng of individuals who have heard that same story. It's everywhere. Jesus died, was buried, and raised from the dead. You're like, how many people receive that and stand on that and not budge? The apostles, the disciples didn't. They all hit the roads. Right. You're like, that shows you. And they witnessed it first. That, that tells you it's no cakewalk. It's not easy. 
Yeah. We, we were saying this, I said this in my sermon this last Sunday. Just because things are simple doesn't mean they're easy. That is correct. I mean, this is not easy. It's not easy. That's not my easy. whole point. Look, the wilderness is coming. <laughs> it's part of it. And guess what? You don't even have to go there. The Holy Spirit's going to take you. So get ready for the wilderness. Uh, I will say this as we sign off, because uh, we talked a lot about spiritual warfare today. One of the best books that I've read on spiritual warfare was a friend of mine named Joe Beam. It's called Seeing the Unseen. So if you if you want to look that up on Amazon and get it, and it's, it's scary, you know, because he does a deep dive on evil spirits and what the Bible says about evil. Well, but he starts the conversation. That's what you got to do. You it's it's do a it. mean world. You got to pick a side. That's exactly right. So well, that's I a appreciate, good resource. I, I appreciate y'all letting me. I can't uh, wait to hear the sermon. Practice my sermon. That's it. So if you don't, if you didn't, uh, if you were thinking about coming. Good sermon, Sunday, Jace. Uh, good sermon. <laughs> Because y'all won't be there. I think this will air after, so you'll get to you get. Be to careful. Show. Don't be raising your voice too much. I'm not a holler, Phil. Uh, <laughs> I'm just. But you get excited. So I get I. excited. I'll have an occasional, you know, outburst, outburst. outburst. But, you know, I'm a mumbler by nature. If I had any kind of homiletical problem, it's I used to be a mumbler. And I didn't like making eye contact. <laughs> So, you know, yeah. if you're mumbling and you're looking the other way, it's probably not going to be a good speech. So this Sunday, this last Sunday, I was speaking in second service. You weren't in there. So they have this little podium thing. It's real lightweight, you know. And I was going along with something. And for some reason, I mean, I pulled a dad. I just I slammed my hand down on the table. <laughs> yeah. I was emphasizing. And, and it left. They didn't leave, but it was it was a loud pop well out of the corner of my eye tara foster was sitting there and i saw her jump i said well i just woke tara up you know everybody started laughing but i mean i didn't realize when i hit that thing it was hollow sounded and it just like a rifle shot went off in there so i thought you know pretty good sound effects (laughs) we'll see you next time So we're so glad you guys were with us today. You can subscribe on iTunes or Spotify or YouTube or Facebook. And be sure and rate us on iTunes so that other people can know about the podcast.